Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on fraud and cybercrime. And my name is Gavin Quiggan. I'm the head of operational resilience and technology risk at NetBank Private Wealth. I have over eight years' experience working in cybersecurity, fraud, and data protection roles. I'm a senior uh, lead auditor for security, GDPR practitioner, and also a business continuity professional. I'm joined today um, by Maureen, um, who's joined us from South Africa. So, uh, hello, Maureen. Hi, Gavin. Thank you. My name is Maureen Skitter. Um, I'm the Financial Crime Governance Risk Manager uh, for the NetBank Private Wealth Business. I joined from NetBank South Africa at the beginning of this year, and I've been working within financial crime in the industry as a whole for about 10 years now. And just so everybody knows, after this, there'll be an answer and question ses session. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to get to everybody's questions. If we can't, we'll try to get to everyone afterwards or respond to questions that, that could not be answered if we run out of time. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so it's great to see so many of you join today. Um, we're, we're seeking to give you an overview on the risks of falling victim to a, to a fraudster or, or a cyber criminal. Um, and we'll also give you some advice on, on how to protect yourself. Before we get going, um, we just need to ensure that everyone realizes that this, this webinar is for information only. While it isn't likely given the subject matter, we need to confirm we are not providing advice or recommendation with regard to your financial affairs, as well as um, legal or tax. Uh, not least, NetBank Private Wealth does not provide legal and tax advice. You should always seek professional advice before making any financial, legal, and tax decisions. Um, and finally, just on the housekeeping, today's discussion is taking place under Chatham House rules. So um, last year, I provided a, a, a webinar specifically on cybercrime, um, and we need to just, just take a moment to, to describe the links between fraud and cybercrime. Um, basically, cybercrime is criminal activities carried out by means of a computer or the internet. And then secondary to that, um, once a, a fraudster has been able to get into uh, somebody's uh, access or or uh, login, they then look at what fraudulent activity can take place from that point. So, Gavin, I think just a reminder, people can go have a look on our NetBank Private Wealth site about the cybercrime uh, uh, webinar you did last year to refresh themselves on a bit more detail on what you discussed in that session, the types of cybercrime and how people use technology as a tool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's worth just mentioning, uh, reflecting on cybercrime, the, the, the various ways and, and something we will talk about uh, during this webinar. But just, just to refresh, uh, phishing, that's a, a type of uh, potential fraud that's done over email, which we'll elaborate on during the session. Um, smishing, uh, I know these are strange terms, but that's um, doing the same thing, but using text messages or, or SMSs. And there is actually another one called phishing, um, which is... Uh, doing that same activity over a phone. So you may hear these terms and they may sound complicated, but at the end of the day, they're, they're a way that fraudsters and criminals will, will try and perform uh, their activities. I think it's important to understand why we wanted to do this webinar as well, to say that fraudsters don't only target specific demograph demographics and specific people who are either tech savvy or not tech savvy, but anyone can become a victim of fraud and the purpose is to help you identify when that potentially might happen to you. So I think that the key question is a lot of people might be asking what is fraud and how are they targeting their victims? Yeah, so looking at um, perhaps a, a definition of fraud that I quite like is wrongful or criminal deception intended to result in financial or personal gain for the criminal. Um, so you, the, the likes of uh, a deliberate attempt uh, pretending to be a person or a business to defraud an unsuspecting client, um, and then then unfortunately there's a loss to the uh, to the client or or to yourself. So um, there's a number of different ways that, that these uh, fraudsters uh, will try and scam people. Um, one of the, the common ones is through scare tactics. So 
the likes of saying um, an account will be deactivated or there is potential fraud that can happen if you don't perform an action. Um, but also, uh, and it's an unfortunate thing, but just recently with the, the situation with the COVID pandemic, um, we're seeing more and more uh, targeting people with COVID screening or vaccinations um, or, or ways to get further information. Now, what I'd always say is uh, go on the official government sites, only ever respond to the official emails or communications, uh, never respond to, to anything that, that doesn't seem to be genuine. And the, the other one that we're still seeing, it's been around for a number of years, but still happens is um, that, that you've won money uh, from a foreign country or uh, part of an inheritance uh, and you have to provide an, an upfront payment. This just isn't something that would happen uh, if it was genuine. So only ever act on uh, on genuine uh, companies or, or communications from government. Um, I think what's important to take note of is that often fraudsters target people after a legitimate transaction event if you've bought a house, for example, if you've signed up for for a new service, sometimes either your your emails or something is intercepted. I had a good example of this last week when I just came across to the Isle of Man, had to hand in quite a few documents to the government offices. And a couple of days later, after I physically went to the offices, I got an email that said, please, can you provide the exact same documents, certified documents and a lot of personal information to us via email and immediately i was skeptical because i had just handed in all those same documents uh, physically and i went back to the person and said why would i have to send it via email when i've already handed them in physically where oftentimes people do respond because it's right after an event that took place to say okay this is linked so that means I have to do it. So always just pause and wait and ask a question to make sure that it's a le legitimate request um, from someone that you have to provide that information to. So I think besides the scams we've already mentioned, Gavin, there are a couple of more prevalent scams that we've been seeing across various sectors as well as specifically in the banking sector. So what online scams do you think there are out there that people need to be aware of what's going on yeah um i mean there are some things that have been around for a long time um uh, but as, as i was touching on COVID, there uh sometimes these fraudsters will uh, act um based on on a news article or something big that's obviously happening in the world um so what, what we do see is impersonation of, of well-known uh, or even lesser known companies to scam a person um, into an investment or, or some sort of payment fraud. Um, we also see that, that payment uh, interceptions. So um, I've seen this for a number of years where um, there's an email come through for paying an invoice um, and actually it's been intercepted. The banking details have been changed and, um, and, and actually if that payment was to go through, uh, that would be going to a fraudster's account rather than the, the genuine supplier or person's account. Um, we, we've also seen um, financial institutions and I've seen this across uh, the Isle of Banks and further afield um, in the UK as well, where people are asked to uh, test their online services their banking online services um they may have just set up and and the person will talk them through uh how to make a payment uh, and again this isn't genuine this is not something that, that any bank would do um you're responsible for your online banking security as much as we are so uh you know if that sort of situation was ever happening then then don't respond to that um and there's other things there. Government organisations may be in touch, uh, wanting people to to prevent a fraud, uh, for asking for for personal information. Um, again, you know, don't provide personal information unless you're absolutely 100% comfortable that, that it's genuine. And I think what people can do in terms of examples that the banking contact, rather phone your bank up by yourself separately, uh, contact your relationship manager if you have someone like that, confirm that it's a legitimate request before just providing information. Absolutely. Um, and, and one other thing that, that we see a lot of um, is golden opportunity scams as they're, as they're known. 
Um, these are the things where there's an offer of something um, that looks really good. And actually the way I would describe it is that if it looks too good to be true, uh, unfortunately it, it usually is. And what we've seen in, in the financial industry is um, in investment fraud, where somebody is offering uh, an extremely good return on an investment. Um, and, you know, people in the know might say that that doesn't feel right. But but then sometimes uh, a big return sounds like a great thing and, and, and people have acted on these. Um, but what I would always do in that situation is research the company if it's not known to you. Um, if it is known to you, uh, such as ourselves, then, then contact uh, our client services uh, department and make sure that, uh, that it's genuine. Um, you may be signed up to our newsletter. You'll know what those newsletters usually look like. Um, and, and, and if it doesn't seem right, uh, if it's out of the ordinary, then again, just contact us. Take that moment to make sure that it's definitely something uh, that's genuine. People need to be aware of the fact that fraudsters often impersonate well-known companies. We've had many examples where a well-known co company's logo has been, been used by someone to pretending to be either NetBank or any other well-known institution. So also be careful of that type of thing and independently confirm information being provided that it is in fact a legitimate offer that's being placed. The other type of scam we we see lately is in the medical field charitable organization, especially with COVID taking place. There are a lot of people either wanting to to you to donate for vaccine purposes or for helping other institutions. A good example of this is the current tragic situation that's happening in India. I've seen on social media in the last week or so, so many organizations saying, if you want to help the people in India with um, what's currently going on, you can donate in on various sites. The key thing is, potentially, some of these might not be as legitimate as others. So making sure that when you do do charitable organization, donate to tra charitable organizations, that it, it is in fact a legitimate organization and the money is going towards what they're purporting it to go to. So you can do this by actually going to some of these sites, but uh, the actual charitable sites to make sure that the information you're being provided is legitimate, but also all the other organizations potentially using this tragic situation to also cash in and potentially defraud people out of money to playing on everybody's sympathies is a difficult thing, but people are unfortunately unscrupulous sometimes. Yeah, and, and uh, just this morning on my way into work, I, I heard uh, a news article uh, talking about exactly the same sort of thing. So, you know, it is quite prevalent um, in, in the world at the moment. Um, so, you know, advice there, uh, as Marine said, is, is checking out these companies. But also, if, if it's related to COVID, only use the valid government websites um, and, and follow their guidance. Um, don't pay uh, money to, to online sources or, or, or fall for any quick or miracle cures. Um, we're being provided with a lot of uh, genuine information from the government. So stick to that and make sure that, uh, that you follow that. It's the same on social media. Uh, there's an awful lot of information there. But as we well know, social media is, is not necessarily, it's a good thing, but it's not necessarily a good thing in, response, in respect of, of something serious like, uh, like the pandemic. Um, sticking with that that sort of area, something else um, that, that's being seen a lot at the moment is, is job um, and employment scams, uh, offers of work um, that, that, you know, people are desperate to, to get a job and get back working if they've been unfortunate and, and, and lost a, a job. Um, and we've seen things like um, you have to pay uh, an upfront payment for your home setup um, or, or providing a CV in advance of, of anything else. Um, CV contains a lot of personal information that is extremely valuable to a fraudster. Legit, legitimate companies wouldn't ask for an upfront payment um, and, and they wouldn't come out of the blue and ask for a CV. It, it would be through a, a genuine HR uh, website or contact. Um, and, and you know, make sure you do research before providing any information or get in touch with the company 
Um, and again, be, be wary uh, of maybe information on social media or, or LinkedIn. Just make sure that, uh, you know, it is the company that, that maybe you know you're expecting. Uh, but just take that few minutes to research and, and contact. Um, I know HR department would much prefer a, a quick call. Uh, you're even showing your interest, but also to make sure that you're safe. Yeah, I think a lot of people take it for granted that LinkedIn, for example, is a very safe, secure site that's focused on, on work and networking. However, unfortunately, as for everything else, fraudsters infiltrate that network quite easily, pretending to be either CEO of a company. And again, people post a lot of information about the, themselves on LinkedIn um, as one of the social media sites. So always be careful of the type of information you post online because fraudsters use the information being posted to create a fake identity so that they can impersonate you either with a financial institution or with other places to pretend that they're Gavin Quiggan when they're not in fact Gavin. So I think the key thing people need to do to be aware of how to prevent fraud is not to panic often you get a call or an email or a text message or something that says your account is some of there's fraudulent activity on your account and that creates a panic effect because obviously no one wants to lose the money in their account so the fraudsters do this type of thing to create this panic situation where you don't want to ask questions, you just act. So it might not be easy in that instance, but the key is not to panic, take a breath, ask all the questions that you need to ask to make yourself feel comfortable. And do not fall for the pressure that they put you on, uh, under to say, you have to do this or a quite a popular scam is um, blackmail to say you have to pay x amount in bitcoin or they're going to release some sort of information to you uh, about you to the public or to your family members it's um it's unfortunate um the, the way i look at, at fraud prevention and, and have done for, for many years now is you have to start from a point of, of not trusting which i know is a, is a bit of a sad thing to say but if you start at that point and build up the trust through through questioning um through research uh, then you can gain confidence in in the communication that, that's happening uh, don't take things at, at face value straight away as Maureen says, don't don't comply when pressure is applied. A genuine company would not be applying that level of pressure to somebody. Um, companies like ourselves, obviously, we want to help you. Uh, and if there was a situation, we would be doing that in a, in a very controlled and, and professional manner. Um, when, when we talk about phishing, just, just some simple things about the emails is consider the spelling or the language, the grammar in the email. Does it look like something you'd expect to see? Uh, are there a lot of errors? Uh, in, in the content of it, uh, is the logo the type of logo you'd expect to see? Uh, and also be very careful about links in emails. Um, you quite often put your cursor over a link uh, and see the name of the website that it's going to. But, but my advice would be, um, even if you think it's genuine, uh, it's better not to click a, click a link um, unless you're absolutely certain. And I, th I think people can also be aware that if you go and look for certain companies, that uh, if you can't find an online presence, quite often that's a major red flag that a company may not be legitimate, um, even if it's just a bad review. So simple example, if you look for a place to stay when you're going on holiday and you can find nothing about that company that tends to be somewhat of a flag that potentially that's not a legitimate place to stay. The same applies for, for looking at after your money. So if it's an investment scam like we spoke about or any type of financial or payment or purchase of something, independently confirm the information so that you are comfortable that you know where your funds are going to when making payments. Um, it's any one of us can fall victim to a scam or someone pretending to be something. I had a while back that I received an email notification to say someone has gifted me a voucher 
And immediately I thought it was some sort of scam because firstly, it was a shop very far removed from me at that point in time. And I just, and it doesn't say it's a gift. It doesn't say who the voucher is from or any context. It expects you to click on a link. And immediately I thought this was some sort of scam, but luckily the person who had gifted me the voucher said to me, oh, I sent you a voucher. And I said, oh, I thought it was a scam. So it is so easy to, to fall victim to clicking on links. So always, when is it expected? Is it something you were looking at? And take it from there. Just caution. Yeah, absolutely That's caution. That's the key thing. Definitely. So um, we spoke quite a bit there about uh, potential examples of fraud uh, and also um, uh, what to do to, to help pre prevent fraud for yourself. There's a lot of resources available uh, online. Uh, the NedBankPrivateWealth.com website uh, provides quite a bit of information there uh, about uh, ourselves and how uh, how you can help yourself and how we can help you. Um, but also there, there are a number of other uh, sites across our, our jurisdictions. Um, governments provide a lot of information around the trends and uh, contact information about um, if you've been a victim of a, a fraud or or suspect that the, there's a, a problem there. So the, the Isle of Man has a suspicious email reporting service, which was launched, I think, uh, a year or 18 months ago. And, and they're tracking the trends of, of phishing emails that are happening uh, in the Isle of Man. UK has a has a, a service that's been launched in a number of years now, which is called Action Fraud. Uh, they provide uh, a lot of information and resources on on fraud matters uh, and a reporting service. Um, Jersey has a fraud prevention forum, um, and finally, Guernsey government they provide guidance on scams and issues that have have been experienced within uh, within their jurisdiction. Yes, so the the way to help yourself in a lot of instances is making sure you do go check out these government sites as well as the NetBank Private Wealth. Uh, web internal website where we will keep the webinar up later on for anyone who wants to go back to some of these as well as other material we'll be posting. Uh, to educate yourself on the types of scams allows you to be prepared. So when you receive a type of email, a phone call, a text, it might ring a bell to say, oh wait, I saw this as a potential fraudulent scam that's going around in the area that I'm living in and it allows you to take the necessary action um, so that you don't become a victim, or if you were had already fallen victim to such a scam, to know who to report to, what the next steps are. And that's very informative, these sites. Um, as well as we've got a fraud hotline that's currently on that you can contact if you are concerned about anything, as well as a Visa card hotline. Um, if your card for, for some reason has been skimmed or cloned or whatever it might have been and you think you might become a victim of fraud. So, yeah, I think we've got yeah. a couple of questions Good. Um, that's come through. So one of the questions is that there was a statistic saying that 7% of the UK and US banks have seen a spike in cybercrime. Is that the case across all UK banks, or is it just the bigger ones? Okay, uh, well, I, I can't quote exact statistics on, on, on the figure, um, but what I would say is there is definitely a spike in cybercrime, um, not just in financial institutions, but it, it's, it's increasing um, year on year. Um, and, and as I say, the way that these are being done is changing year on year. So uh, for fraud professionals uh, like ourselves, we really have to you know, stay ahead of the uh, the game on this and do what we can. So hopefully that, uh, hopefully that helps answer that one. Yeah, I think it does. And I, the statistic is quite high. So I don't know either if 7% is the right statistic, but there is a, especially throughout 2020, through the COVID pandemic, there has been a massive spike in people falling victim to fraud, uh, whether it is them, someone conning them or someone stealing money from them, the, the jump has been significant, especially in the last year, but in the last couple of years, the trend has continued upwards instead of downwards. And hence, a lot of the governments taking action to try and help prevent and detect it. I think 
couple of weeks ago, I heard on the news that someone was saying that the UK government specifically needs to see what more they can do because fraud is becoming such a big issue within the UK that the government needs to step in and see what else they can do to help. So another question we got is what is the purpose of multi-factor authentication? Because often we do as a client, when you sign up for something, get frustrated if you have to give an email, a text message, and a phone call for something. What is the purpose of that? Okay, so uh, it sounds like a complicated term, multi-factor authentication, or it's, you also sometimes hear two-factor authentication. Um, it's an extra level of security, and, and one way I've often described it is in your house, you obviously lock your door, and you might lock it with a, with a, with a key lock, uh, but you might put another bolt on or a, or a second bolt and basically you're increasing your levels of security and, and that's exactly uh, what multi-factor authentication is you'll have a password but then you then you might get a text message with a code um, or you might have something on your mobile device that provides a code and, and it, it's something although it does take that little bit of extra time um, that is helping secure um, the service that you're using so uh, extremely important and I think we'll see more uh, in that sort of area as technology advances and then another question is what is the feeling about free password vaults and how can they be used to to protect yeah um, I, I, I can't give specific uh, advice around which password vault or password manager to use but what I would say is there is a lot of information uh, available if you were to just Google. Um, I, I've used a comparison site before. Uh, and like anything, um, if it's free, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but um, there'll be more professional uh, password vaults that, that you'd be able to use for, for a subscription. Um, and the, these are basically uh, very secure uh, applications that can store your passwords. Uh, I mean, e even uh, mobile phones will do it uh, as, as, as part of their actual um, normal operating system. Um, so I would advise, uh, advise uh, using them wherever possible. Um, I'd also advise to have complex passwords and different passwords um and also uh, it's an old favorite but, but don't write them down you know use the use the device to to help you in that respect and then another question we had is how concerned should people be if sites that aren't necessarily related to banking um are compromised or hacked so if you look at zoom if you look at any fitness app or something you might use that's not related to your banking and you receive a notification that potentially the site has been hacked or data has been compromised. What, how does that affect people in terms of their bank or their, yeah. their key things? I've got an example of that that happened to me where a fitness app that I was using was compromised. And funny enough, both my sister and I used the same app. And we both got uh, these blackmail emails that I was talking about full of spelling errors, full of syntax completely wrong, saying that they're going to release this video of me. And I still to this day do not know which video, but someone who has a guilty conscience of something might fall for, for that. And it wasn't a banking compromise. But however, some of the information they had may make you think, especially people who use the same password, use the same username on various platforms because people are human and can't remember everything that to be different you might then think so a good yeah. rule of thumb is to go change especially your banking passwords as soon as you become aware of this um, to ensure that you do not fall victim to yes, that crime absolutely there are services and there are applications that, that actually give you information uh, about uh, hacked uh, websites or, or hacked app apps applications on phones uh, but the, the big ones you, you do tend to see in the media quite quickly um, and, and as I say I mean, do, do act on it just just as, as a, a matter of caution uh, change the password um, you know make sure that uh, that you don't become a victim of, of something like that uh, one good thing is the companies will respond extremely quickly to those situations and, and mitigate the, the problem wherever possible uh, but as, as we say, uh, it's best to help yourself as well. And for the, for the sake of a password change, for for a bit of a bit of confidence that things are okay, I, I would always recommend doing that. 
And if you have a Google account, which a lot of people do, um, there is a way on your settings where you can view which uh, apps that you use have been compromised. Um, I can't tell you right now, but there is a setting and you can go view which apps was compromised when. And when we did that with that fitness app that was, was compromised, we could clearly see that's when we started getting the emails that contained usernames, passwords, because that hack had taken place. Okay. Um, well, uh, we could we could talk about this subject for uh, for a long time, um, but we only have uh, the thirty minutes which which we've used, unfortunately. So that's all we have time for. I'd like, I'd like to uh, thank Maureen for her support. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and just before we go, I want to let you know uh, about uh, a couple of upcoming webinars. So the first one um, on Tuesday, the eleventh of May. Uh, the subject there is divorce, more legal and financial ramifications um, and we also have um, a webinar on Thursday the 20th of May uh, what's happening with uh, UK property you can register for these webinars um, on our bright talk channel the details will be posted on the bank private wealth website later uh, on in the next uh, few weeks so uh, thank you very much and that's all from us today and uh, take care thank you